Okay, so we're starting in Chot Yisodeh Torah, Perek Chet, the eighth oh, chapter of oh, Yisodeh oh, Torah. And um, this chapter actually contains... Is it permitted to ask questions in the Right, I mean, yeah, right, you no, may... Have, right, right. So this chapter actually contains some of the, or, or, or one of the most <laughs> fundamental... Um, axioms of Judaism, one of the most fundamental axioms of Judaism, and what I'm talking about is what is the very foundation of the Jewish acceptance of the Torah, right? Why did we, Am Yisrael, accept the Torah, right? Why did we enter into a covenant with Hashem? What was the basis for that? And that's a really important question because, you know, different religions have different foundations. So, for example, if you look at, um, uh, you look at Christianity, for example, so what happened there? So one of their, let's say, the, 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 the seminal belief of the Christians is that a person, one individual, her name was uh, Mary Magdalena, she saw um, this uh, uh, going up, uh, you know, off the cross and flying into the heavens. So that's, that's their seminal belief. That's their starting point. And she says, well, I saw him flying in the heaven. So you saw, you saw him flying in the heaven? Yes, I saw him. So do you believe her or don't you believe her? Well, if you believe her, then become a Christian and, you know, so you believe her. Okay. And then the question becomes, I mean, after, after, after. okay, right. So, and then the question becomes, what's, who was she? Was she trustworthy? That's a question, right? So is it somebody that we, we can believe in? Is it somebody that we would accept? So Mary Magdalena, it's an interesting question. One day I'm going to talk about that. It's not the perfect point of this class now to talk about that. Then we can go, let's say, to, Christian, uh, to uh, Islam. So what's the point? What's the seminal belief of Islam? So there also, somebody saw Muhammad flying on his donkey to Allah Mabba. Okay, that would, that's a seminal belief. So again, you say, do you believe that person? You, you, can, you can choose to believe him, you can choose not to believe him. It's, you know, it's, it's up to you. I mean, and if you believe him, if you believe that uh, Muhammad went up to the Shamaim and uh, so on, so accept it and not. What's the seminal belief of Judaism? And this is so important because in this way, Judaism is different than all other religions. It's different than all other nations. Okay, and that's what we're going to be studying today. Okay, what's our seminal belief? We all heard it directly. Uh, what I didn't hear, I'm sorry. Very nice. And, uh, we Sina, all yeah, heard it heard directly. And that's what we're going to be studying now. And that's so important. So please open up Yechot Yesodea Torah. If you have the first page, it's on the bottom of the first page. Yesodea Torah, Perek Chet Halacha Alech Moshe Rabbeinu. That's what we're starting. That's what, so that's, that's what we're dealing with today. We said this is the axioms of Judaism. And we studied about Moses and we studied about his prophecy. Now we're going to study about the relationship between Moshe Rabbeinu and Am Yisrael. Why we accept him as the Shaliyah Chayel. Why do we accept Moses as our, or Hashem's emissary to us? Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu was sent by Hashem, and he's our emissary. He's our emissary to Hashem. He's Hashem's emissary to us, right? Why is that? Why, why, why did we choose him? So here's the point. Moshe Rabbeinu. Moses. Lo he'eminu bo yisrael mipenei ha'otot she'asa. The Jewish people did not say, you know what? Moses made fantastic miracles. Wow. We're going to accept him as a prophet. No, that's not what happened at all. It is true that Moses made fantastic miracles. That's not the reason we accepted him as our emissary to God or God chose him as the emissary to the Jewish people. Right? No, that's not the reason. And why? If you believe that somebody is great because he does miracles, well, you always going to have doubts about that because, you know, some people know how to do amazing miracles. And we spoke about uh, last week about uh, David Copperfield who once made the Statue of Liberty disappear, right? When I was a young child, perhaps impressionable, made the Statue of Liberty disappear. That's an amazing miracle. It was there one second and a second later it was gone and everybody was on this boat and like, wow, like, where is it? Like, you know, I was a little young and, you know, perhaps, uh, as I said, um, you know, nowadays I would look at it and be a little more skeptical. And I, as I said in my class last week, the amazing part of that miracle is the very next day, there it was again. And he not only made it disappear, he made it come back. So this is a miracle. Well, you say, maybe it's not. Maybe there's something going on there that I just don't know. So had we accepted Moses because of miracles, there would always be doubt in our hearts. So miracles are not it. 
That's not what, that's not what makes us accept him. She'ef shah, she'yaseh ha'ot belat v'kishuv. It's possible that there was a trick. Now we know that Pharaoh, he had a bunch of magicians, and Pharaoh had his hartumim, and when Moses brought out the, uh, the stick, and he threw the stick, the rod, on the floor, and the rod turned into a snake, what did Ma'opar all do? Same. The exact same thing. Well, why is that? So why does the Torah bring that to us? What's the point of that? To tell us that the miracles are not it. Because if you're going to believe in miracles, if I'm going to believe in Moses because he turned a rod into a snake, let me believe in the hartumim of Paro because they did the exact same thing. You see why the Torah does that? So it tells us, wait, this is not, that's not it. This is not the point. This is not the point of the miracles. Okay? So why do we need to have Moshe and the Talmud Moshe to do that in front of this small call? Because that's that. their language? To relate to that. Okay, so they oh, 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 that's a good question. So now the question you're asking is, well, why did Moses do that miracle? Right, why did he come to... Right, so that's a good question. And, and, and we can actually study that parasha and understand it. And he's going to deal with some of the miracles that Moses did. He's not going to deal with that specific one. So look at the next line. Let's, let's deal now, not with the miracles that Moses did in, in, um, in the palace of Pharaoh. Let's deal with the miracles that Moses did in the desert. Ela. Kol ha'otot she'asa b'midbar lefi ha'sorech asa'an. All the miracles that Moses did in the desert those were done for a purpose. He wasn't trying to impress people by those miracles. When the Jewish people were in the desert, Moshe Rabbeinu had one thing in mind, and what was that? How to survive. You have to survive. It's a desert, there's no water, there's no food, the sun is very hot, there's scorpions, there's snakes. How do you survive that? That's why he did the miracles, right? So. This was not in order to prove that he was a Nabi. At this point, they all accepted the Nibu'ah Moshe Rabbeinu. They all accepted that he's a prophet. So for example, let's bring an example. Sarah le'ashkia et The Egyptians are chasing after the Jewish people, and Hashem says, you know what, I gotta do something. Just, you know, these people, they're a bunch of pests. I mean, they let us go. Then a couple of days later, no, we want the Jewish people back. Like, you know, when you say Hajra, like just enough is enough. So Hashem says, you know what? Enough of these people. So what does he do? Splits open the sea. They run into the sea. He covers them in the ocean, solves a problem. The purpose of that miracle was to solve a problem. What was the problem? The Egyptians just couldn't let go of the Jewish people. That's it. We got rid of them. Hashem tore open the, the, the ocean, and they all drowned in the ocean, and now the Jews were finally free from that headache. The miracle had a utility. Do you understand? It had a purpose. That was the purpose. The purpose was to solve a problem. Another example. Here you have two million people in the desert. How do two million people survive in the desert? Well, you need food. You go on a camping trip. So before you go on a camping trip, what do you do? You say, okay, we're going to be five people on the camping trip, eight people on the camping trip. Let's bring food. How many days are we going to be? We're going to be away for a week. We need food. You have to survive. Without food, you can't survive. Okay, so the Jewish people now are in the desert. What are they going to do? They're going to pick fruits off the tree. There's no trees, right? How are they going to get water? There's no water. Okay, and by the way, when they were in the desert, the desert that the Jewish people went to, and Hanabam speaks about this in the Moreni Bukhim, Hanabam says, he took them to places in the desert where even the Bedouins didn't go. He took them to places in the desert where nobody dared go because there was no way to survive there. So even people who are used to surviving in the desert, they didn't go to where the Jewish people went. You got it? They didn't do that. Because they wouldn't. They wouldn't be able to survive. So now you have two million people in the desert. How do you give them food? How do you give them water? Yes, go ahead. No, I just want to say that these gentlemen do not Arabic, yes? And how you say in Arabic, I have a problem, please help me solve it. So there's only one word in Arabic, and this Arabic word comes from the Hebrew, the burning, yes? And the burning means I'm in the midbar, and I need a guide. Fantastic. Yes, it's a desert. So I go right, left, uh, ahead, you know, behind me. Everything seems the same. The burning. I need a dabat. What means a dabat in Hebrew, a rabbinic Hebrew? A guide. Right, right. See? It's the burning. Yes. That's from the poor, means you should tell the So we needed food. 
As my father said, what do we do with food? So we have the Dabar. Moshe Rabbeinu is our Dabar. He's our God. What does he do for us? Hori lanu et man. We get the man from the sky. It's a, is it a miracle? Yeah, it's a miracle. Okay. So the man starts falling when the Jewish people are hungry. And it falls for 40 years. And when the Jewish people, the last day they're in uh, the desert, they enter Israel. On that day, the man stops falling. Is that a miracle? Yes, it's a miracle. What was it done for? Was it done to impress the people? No, it was not done to impress anybody. It was done so that they can survive. That miracle had a very specific purpose. That purpose was so the Jewish people can survive. They need food, two million people. Another example of a miracle that was... Can I ask you a question? Isn't every miracle to, to solve a problem? Mm. If, it if it wasn't stress, right. and if it wasn't needed, then you don't need a miracle. So, interesting question, and that brings me to what Mikey said. The miracles that were done in Egypt, the ten miracles, turning the water into blood, um, making the frogs or the alligators, as you interpret it, enter the people's houses, which usually they stay in, in their marsh area and then enter the houses. Kinim, turning the soil, the dust, into a lice, and now the lice are attacking the people. And all those miracles, those were not done to solve a problem. Those were actually done to impress. And why was that? Why did he want, because I think when he, I think maybe Mikey, or maybe, maybe you, I forget, one of you mentioned anyway, that he wanted to speak to them at their language. Right. So Hashem is kind of getting into a dialogue with the Egyptians, you know, just like kind of like, you know, like, let's start talking. So he throws the rod on the floor, turns into a snake. Okay, we can do the same thing. And, you know, he turns the blood into, uh, the water into blood, I'm sorry. And then the Egyptians, like, you know, like, you know, can you imagine this? But it just is like, this is like a great scene. It's just a great scene. Like, you know, if you have like uh, Mel Brooks or somebody, you know, it's like, there's no water in Egypt, right? Like nobody has anything to drink. And, and you know, it's like you open the faucet and blood comes out. And then the Khartoumim of Pa'o, they come with a bowl of water and they turn it into blood. It's like, wow, like that's really precious. Like, you know, there's no water, like the last water in Egypt and you just turned it into blood. Can you turn the blood back to water, please? Or can you do that? But you see how like Hashem is like, getting this dialogue going back and forth and back and forth. And like, eventually, at first, like the Egyptians are a little arrogant, but little by little, they kind of realize something is happening here. And it's not till the 10th Makkah, where Paro finally says, you know, guys, you were all right. <laughs> this is kind of like, this is real. Okay, so you understand what's that dialogue. But, but other than that, I agree with you. The miracles are almost always, almost, not, not always, almost always for a specific Problem, we need to solve the problem, and here's how we solve the problem through the miracle. Yes? So also, when they came into Israel to carry out their thing, so that was another example of why did they have to leave you know, make a like, like Yamsuf coming into Israel, they had to leave their land, they had to leave their land. Coming in, that was purely to show the rest of the Bohemian. No, why? No, that was to let the people f- pass, to pass over. They had to pass over. How do you pass over? It's a river. There's little kids. People are carrying bags. The, 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 um, the river is there. It's like a, it's a torrent of water. How do you course over to the other side? Uh, the, the Jordan River. Ah, Remember the other day? When they come from the Desi Yoshua, they have to cross over. Right? Right? So also that's, that's a purpose. You know, there are some miracles that were done for, in pre- for show. There are some miracles that were done for show. A greatest example of a miracle that was done for show is Eliyahu Hanavi. He's in Hara Carmel. All the Jews back then, they all believed in Abu Dazara. And what was happening is the whole day he was telling the, the Abu Dazara, you know, come on guys, you said you can bring fire from the, from the heaven. Bring, bring the fire from the heaven. You're like, this is what you're good at. And they're like jumping up and down and, you know, dancing and, you know, blah, 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 and whatever else they do. And it just wasn't happening. And finally he said, you know, on any Hashem, on any fire comes from the heaven. That was done to impress. So there are some miracles done to impress. But by and large, it's always to solve a problem. So the miracles that were done in the desert were done to solve a problem. So for example, Samir'u, they were thirsty, they need water. There was stone, and he took water out of the stone. That was a great miracle, but it was done for a purpose, yes? Um, How do we explain things that the Egyptians did, like turning their stags into snakes? David Copperfield making the Statue illusions. of Liberty. Just, yeah, illusions. Yeah, or walking through the Great Wall of uh, walking through the Great Wall of China. There was another uh, miracle that he did. He he got across the Great Wall of China. One second he was on this side, the other second he was on the other side. It was again as a young child it was pretty impressive growing up. Um, I'm sure now if I go to Las Vegas I'll be a little more um, 
um, incredulous, but back then. So yeah, people are incredulous. People believe in things, right? So it's just, it's a sketch. Mm-hmm. All, the ma- all the magic is a sketch, right? So that's in Egypt. Kafru Adat Korach. Okay, another example of a purpose. Um, the Korach, he does a revolution against Moshe Rabbeinu. He wants to go up. He wants to become a more important pro. I want to become... So what happened? What does Hashem do to him? He brings him down. He swallows him down. You see? Purpose. Show people what happens when you want to go up and you don't deserve to be up. Hashem brings you down. So it had a purpose. That's the purpose of that um, miracle. V'chen she'ar kol Almost all the miracles, means all the miracles that were done in the desert, again, in the desert, were done for that purpose. Egypt, as I said, different. Egypt, there was like a fun dialogue going on there between Hashem and the Khartoumim, uh, between Hashem and the Egyptians, but in the desert, it was for a purpose. Got it? Okay, but, so therefore we didn't, yeah. But the signs that, that, Moshe, that Hashem told Moshe to go in Egypt is so that they, are, they, they, they believe in it. A hundred percent. Leman shiti ototai elle bekebo. A hundred percent. That was for in the ones that were done in Egypt. I, I said, and I agree with you, they were done to impress. They were done to people because back then, don't forget, people had no idea there was a God. So God wanted to kind of reveal himself little by little by little. And like by the end of that story, it's like everybody realized there's one God. Like that's, that was like clear. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So, so we don't believe in Moses because of the miracles. So why do we believe in Moses? Well, if it's not because of the miracles. So he said in, in the case of Yemach Shemom Zichro, he flew up to the sky from the, the cross, right? So he flew up. That's like an amazing thing, right? So he flew up. I mean, somebody said he flew up. That's pretty impressive. Or he walked on water. Okay, so he walked on water. Okay, so they believe in him. Or in the case of um, Muhammad, he flew to the Olam Abba on a donkey. What was the name of the donkey? Burak? Burak. Burak, okay, Burak, okay, here. So the Burak took him to Olam Haba. That's a, beautiful, that's a fantastic miracle. My father once said in one of his classes, the only thing is that it was a donkey, so he took him to Olam Haba of the donkeys. Right? But that's, you know, that's because it's a donkey. That's a different story. But the point is he went up to Olam Haba. People saw it. They saw it. Somebody saw it. Well, one person saw it. Okay, so one person saw it. So they saw him going to Olam Haba. Why do we believe in Moshe Rabbeinu? That's a good question. Ah, Uva Mehe Eminubo. Here is the point. The event, the epiphany at Sinai. And here's the important thing. This epiphany, this revelation of Hashem was not to a single individual. This revelation of Hashem was to the entire nation. Nobody had to come to our fathers and say, oh, by the way, did you see what I just saw? No, I didn't see it. What did you see? No, everybody saw it, right? And that's the important thing. It wasn't an individual experience. It was a national experience. And there's a world of a difference between an individual telling me, did you see that UFO? There was a UFO last night? Really? Like, what happened? Tell me. Like, yeah, like there was like a window and I saw these little green creatures. Like, really? But what were you drinking beforehand? Well, there was a football game and I had a bunch of Michelobes and I don't know how many it was, but I definitely saw that UFO. Okay, so like, you know, you can be a little incredulous. You may believe, you may decide not to believe. That's fine. That's an individual experience. But this is a national experience, something that the entire nation sees together at the same time. And that's already something that you don't doubt because you're part of the nation. So now, and, and this is like interesting because like Jews are very intellectual. And you know, when you deal with intellectuals, intellectuals are also dogmatic. And you get two intellectuals in the room, and you'll have like three different opinions, right? Because it's like they just, they, they, they're just always going to argue. And you know, Jews, so you see the Knesset, you ever see like the arguments in the Knesset? Like, like everybody, oh, look at this, unity government. Like, it's really funny. Like, you know, eight months ago, they had a stalemate, right? And they're not going to make a unity government. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen because everybody is so dogmatic, right? That's Jews. Like, we're like that, right? I'm not doing it, okay? And so they have an election. Eight months later, worse stalemate than the first time around. The first time around, there was like actually a chance to make some sort of government. Now there's not even that, right? So, okay, so you're dealing with Jews, and these are really smart people, and they're very dogmatic. And like I say, what did you see last night? You say what you saw. That's exactly what I saw. What did you see? Everybody saw and heard the exact same thing. That's incredible. I mean, like, how does that even happen, right? Because you could have like a, a national experience where everybody t- 
testifies and the testimony is unanimous. There's no doubt about what the experience was. So that's what we're going to be reading in Harambam, but I wanted to explain to you what a national experience means. It means something where everybody agrees. People usually disagree, but in this case, everybody agreed. Yes, please. Yes. First of all, no, the answer is, no, 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 just one second, hold on, stop right there. Until you said, well, is everybody saying the same story? No, that's not true. Everybody never says the same story. You never had a nation universally lying about an experience that they had, and every single person lies and says, yeah, it happened when it didn't happen. That, that's not true, by the way, that's historically inaccurate. But I am willing to acknowledge that there is a historical process here. What I'm saying is that as a nation, we're not individuals, I'm not talking about as individuals, as a nation we have this national experience, okay? Now, let's look at mythology for a moment. There's all these stories about um, Rem Romulus and Remus, right? The two little babies that were dick. Okay, mythology. By the way, mythology is very serious stuff. I don't ridicule mythology and I don't want you to think that I am. So there's all this mythology and this mythology you know, these various um, uh, gods, whether it's, uh, you know, Zeus or whatever, the Greek gods or Roman gods or, or, or Persian gods, all these mythological figures have very deep meanings. They're not just lies. Like, they're not just lies. Just say, oh, it's just a lie. It never happens. It misses the point because it has, it, it, these are, are archetypal national symbols and they have meanings within the context of every nation. But put that on the side. So I'm not here to denigrate mythology. That's not what I'm doing at all. But I have a question about mythology. What's the difference between history and mythology? It's just one word. You either have it or you don't. If you know what the answer is, let me know what it is. What's the difference? The fundamental difference between mythology and history? Answer. Mythology doesn't exist in time. There is no historical time where mythology took place. History exists in time. Okay, now, let's t ask another question. We know that in Judaism, witnesses come before the court and the witnesses establish facts. If you want to establish a fact before the judges, you need to have two witnesses. Now, for those witnesses to establish a fact, before they even start discussing whatever it is they want to discuss, we saw that uh, Reuven, we saw him shooting Shimon. Okay, that's a fact. They want to establish that as a fact. So two witnesses come to court and they want to establish that fact. Before the judges even ask them about the murder and what they saw, what did the judges ask them? The judges asked them seven questions. And from those seven questions, six have to do with time. What day of the week was it? What day of the month was it? What month, uh, what, what month of the year was it? What year in the Shemitah cycle? Six questions that have to do with time. And one question that has to do with space. Because if you are not of the mental clarity where you don't know when, some, when something happened with precision and where it happened with precision, from the perspective of Jewish law, you cannot testify about that. Because whatever feelings you may have, whatever you have, it's a type of mythological knowledge. It's not interesting to the court. So you come to court and you don't know when it happened, you don't know where it happened, you can't testify about it. You're smiling because of what just recently happened? Uh, no, I just, I like how you're saying it. Right. So now when we start the story of Har Sinai, how do we start the story of Har Sinai? Right? So what do we, how do we say? What's the Pesukim? Bachodesh, Hashelishi. Let me open up the Pesukim um, and, I'll, and I'll read it to you because it's really an amazing thing. 
Um, and, and by the way, I, I just have to say, I, sh I should say that I learned all this from my father and his writings. So he, he's actually a source for this because it's a, it's a great Hidush. I just have to, I do have to acknowledge it. Okay, and when the internet... I'm the father. Okay. Okay. Look how it starts. We are about to say the story of the Epiphany at Sinai. First we say time. It was the third month to the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt. On the very first day of the month. We know the year. We know the month. We know the day of the month. We know exactly when it happened in time. This is not mythology. Ladies and gentlemen, mythology does not take place in historical time. Historical time is irrelevant to myths. Okay, that's why it's not historical. I didn't say mythology is not true. It has its own truth in whatever realm that exists. I'm not talking about psychology and archetypes now. That's C.G. Young and that's other stuff. That's Robert Johnson, for those of you who might be interested in the subject. I'm not, to, but that's not history. That's not history. This is history. Now let's talk about space. We know exactly where it happened. It says, They were in that place. And they came to this place. And they stayed there. We know where it happened. We know when it happened. History. Historical fact. And that's the point. So as a nation, we are recording this event in the most historical way possible. No less than the history of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, no less than all the great events that happened in U.S. history, whether it's a Civil War, whether it's a Gettysburg Address, whether it's FDR saying, uh, well, we have to fear, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. These are historical facts because they, we know where it happened, we know when they happened. I mean, Bar Sinai is, exact, Har Sinai is exactly the same thing, and that is so important. So it's not a myth. It's a historical fact. That's my, that's my, uh, my, 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 what I wanted to say to address your point. But let's go back now to the text of Hanambam. And I'm 24% battery. Hopefully we will make it to the end of the class. Okay? Mm -hmm. Can we add, and it's also very unlikely, that parents, a whole generation or generations of parents to their children will continue this I'll, I'll just, I'll just be very frank with you. You know, Judaism, you know, you, 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 know you, you, you can study the text. Anybody can open up the Chumash. To me, the greatest proof of the fact that we receive the Torah in Sinai is just open up the Torah and see what it says, right? And uh, just as, as an example, you know, Isaiah says, and Moshe Rabbeinu says, one day we will return to Israel in the, in the way, way distant future. And Isaiah says, one day you will return to... Now, a hundred years ago, we'll read these things and say, this is like really weird. We've been out of Israel for 200, 2,000 2, 2, years. And it's like, you know, and we still believed it because there was so much truth in the Torah. The Torah was, was, was such an incredible source of, source of wisdom that we couldn't deny its veracity. But now that we came back to Israel after 2,000 years and like having read those prophecies for so long and saying, well, like now this happened also, like that's pretty amazing, right? So, you know, you, you can choose to exercise your intellect. And I said this in my uh, Terasha, you remember Shabbat morning? I said about Shemi'ah, right? What does to hear mean? To, we, the, the, there is no word for uh, command in Hebrew. There is no word to obey in Hebrew, to obey, right? So I said, because we exercise our wisdom, we exercise our intelligence. Is somebody free to say, you know what? I don't believe in the Torah, I want to become a Muslim. I mean, he's free to do it. We're not going to like, you know, nothing we can do. You know, somebody who wants to become a Christian, become a Christian. I mean, I, I hope he doesn't. I really, I really think it's a bad choice. So, you know, people have to exercise their judgment. That's really important. It's like that with everything. Do you believe in global warming? Don't you believe in global warming? Do you believe the temperature is going up? Don't you? Is it? Well, you know, use your knowledge. You know, study a little. Get the facts straight. Try to figure out what's going on. Try to figure out what the politics are behind all the different, you know, and, and reach a conclusion. It's called climate change now. Climate change. Yes, yes, yes. I know. It's called climate change. Oh, right. So, you know, right. And things like that, right? Should we use straw? Shouldn't we use straw? I mean, so in life, and I say this all the time, you got to be smart and you got to exercise your intelligence. There's no like, you know, oh, this is it. No, be smart. We're an intelligent nation and that's why we've survived so long because we always were smart and we saw the truth of the Torah. We were willing to, to, to defend the Torah and, and, and honor our history and our traditions, okay? So let's continue. 
Let's continue. So, number one, we saw it was a visual experience. experience. And number two, we heard. Not somebody else told us. The fire. The fire. So when, when the presence of Hashem descended upon Har Sinai, and together with the presence of Hashem descending upon Har Sinai, all the Malachim descended upon Har Sinai, it was a, it was a crazy, um, um, it was a crazy mind-blowing experience, and we all had the same experience. You know, people take like, uh, you know, to, to go to the other extreme. Chas v'shalom, somebody takes drugs, he has hallucinations. Another person takes drugs, he has hallucinations. The hallucinations of one person, not the hallucinations of the other person. Everybody else is damaging their brain in a slightly different way and killing their brain cells. So the effect of killing your brain cells and seeing these hallucinations is different from person to person. But when you have an experience of illumination, of intelligence, of kedusha, and everybody has that same experience, you know, this is emet, Right? That's not some like weird dimayon, that's not some weird imagination, because imagination is always imagined differently by different people. Furthermore, we're dealing now with Moshe Rabbeinu, because that was the object of this lesson. Why do we believe in Moses? As we're seeing this frightening um, um, process unfolding before our eyes, we see, as we're like standing back from the mountain, because it's terrifying, we see Moshe Rabbeinu entering the thick cloud, going up the mountain. And we heard the voice speaking to him. Now remember, the voice that we heard speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu, the voice of Hashem, was not like a voice that travels through um, sound waves that travel through air, right? Because that's my voice. That's my voice speaking to you. That's sound waves traveling through the air and reaching your eardrums. So the voice that we heard speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu was not that voice. It was a voice that penetrated the mind, right? Because obviously Hashem's voice doesn't just travel through through air, right? There's no vocal cords here that are vibrating, that create this vibration in the ears, but in the air, and then enters the ears. So it's something else. We all had that unique experience. But we heard the words, Moshe, Moshe, Lech emon lahem kach v'kach. We actually heard Hashem speaking to Moses and saying, Moses, you must go and instruct the Jewish people as follows. So we actually heard Hashem speaking to Moses and saying, Moses, go to the Jewish people and tell them this and this. So when Moses comes to us and tells us, um, Hashem wants me to tell you the following, yeah, we know. Well, we know that Hashem already told you because we heard Hashem speaking to you. you. You get the point? That's just so significant. So it's Moses said, listen, I really want you to believe me. I know this is weird, but Hashem just spoke to me and he gave me the Torah. Will you please believe me? No. We heard Hashem speaking to him and then he comes and he speaks to us and he gives us the Torah. The Chen and furthermore, the Pasuk says, In addition to us hearing Hashem speaking to Moses, we also heard Hashem speaking to us. The same voice, the same, you know, um, words entering the brain, for lack of a better word, right? Words entering the brain. So, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, using the best English prose, but I just have no way, other way of s- describing it. So the same words that entered our brain, and we hear Hashem speaking to Moses, entered our brain and told us, So we heard the whole thing, right? At least the first two debelot, right? We heard the first two debelot, so it's the same voice. So we knew that's Hashem. And finally, when Hashem made this covenant, He didn't make the covenant with individuals. He didn't make the covenant with individuals standing there at that moment. He made it with the entire nation. And the nation is eternal. And the nation includes the parents, the children, the children of the children, forever and ever and ever. And that's what we say in the Pasuk, Le'olam Adonai Devar Chani Sabashamayim. We say it 12 times when we open up the Hechal on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, that the word of Hashem is eternal. It's unchanging. It always speaks to us because the Torah is eternal and the covenant is eternal. You understand the point? Okay, so that's so, so now you have the answer to the question. If you have any questions to me, but remember the question was, why do we believe in Moses? Answer to the question because we heard Hashem speaking to Moses, and after Hashem spoke to Moses, He spoke to us. So we 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 understand. Okay, that's God. We experience God, and then we experience Hashem speaking to God. So we have no doubt about it. Zero doubt. There's no doubt about that. As a nation. 
Did anybody here experience the Civil War? No. Do you have any doubt about the Civil War? No. Why? Because you're part of the American nation? That's it. So does anybody here stand by Hasinai? No. Does anybody here not believe in Hasinai? No, because you're part of the Jewish nation. It's that simple. It's really that simple. You don't want to be part of the Jewish nation? No problem. I don't, want to like, I don't like America. I'll go to wherever. I'll go to the Netherlands or some whatever. Okay, so then accept their history. No problem. You can do that. Right? And people do that. Did people ever leave the Jewish nation? They did. Yeah. Do we like it? No. But that's tough luck. I mean, that's, that's life and people do that. Okay? So, questions at this point? If not, I will continue. Silence. Uh, you mentioned that not only did I make this brief with you, but the future people as well. Yes. This is another idea on Hamas Midrash that says everybody was at Hasina. Right. Kind of like Right, and what does that mean? I mean, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure what that means. And, and actually, maybe one day I'll talk about that also, because I, I, I think I have a sense of what that means. I just don't want to, like, right, no, no, but it's a great question, by the way. But, what is, but at the very simple, let's say, from the point of view of law, when we say that everybody was out of Sinai, what we're really saying is that everybody is bound by that, because the minute you're part of the nation, then you're bound by that experience. Not and by the covenant, there. right? Not that you were physically there, but... Not that you were physically there, but it was such a... Um, a, it was such a powerful experience that it affects us uh, to the extent that Mahalan Bam says that if you have a doubt about it, it, probably, it could be that your parents just weren't there. That's what Mahalan Bam says anyway. Um, but the point is, but beyond that, at the, at the point of view of law as a nation, to be a Jew means to accept that seminal experience. That seminal experience being Har... Sinai. That's what it means to be a Jew. So you can't be a Jew and say, I don't accept Tal Sinai, then you're not really part of the Jewish nation. And um, you can't be an American and say, I don't accept the Constitution. That doesn't work. Okay, let's continue. So I have a question. How do you explain the Oh, Perashat uh, Kitisa, I will be happy to explain it. Because, no, listen, it's a good question. It really is, and it deserves a good answer. What was the question? She wants to know, how did the Jewish people do the Haita it's a good question. I want to give it a good answer. Okay, and it deserves a, you know, so a good answer. I, and, and I've actually spoken about this a lot, and, 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 um, and my father's written, spoken and written about it a lot. So, um, you know what? If, if you send me, shoot me an email, I'll send you a link to one of my father's articles where he discusses this very point. Okay. Let's continue. <clears throat> um, okay, continuing in Harambam. Umenayim. So in conclusion, it comes out that it was actually the experience at Sinai. That was the experience that substantiated the Nevu'ah of Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moses is indeed a prophet. And on this, the Pasuk says, Hashem actually tells Moses before this, Moses, the people are going to believe in you. They're going to believe in you forever. And they're eternally going to be um, loyal to the covenant that they enter at Har Sinai. And why is that so? Because I am going to appear before you in the thick of the cloud and I'm going to speak to you so that the people can hear me speaking to you. I want the people to hear me speaking to you. And when they hear me speaking to you, they will never ever have a doubt as to the fact that you are a real body. That's it. That's why he did it that way. So that we have no doubts. So what, it comes, what does it come out from this? Remember, Hashem is telling Moses this before Har Sinai. What happened before Har Sinai? The 10 miracles in Egypt, the 50 miracles on Yamsuf, right? All the man, the water coming out of the stone. So what do we see from here that with all these miracles, the Jews didn't have an eternal belief in Moshe Rabbeinu. They believed, but it wasn't eternal. So where did the eternal belief come from? Here. This is it, right? Um, any miracle, it's kind of like, you know, you go into seminar, I remember like people used to go to seminar in Yeshiva Flatbush, I went to Yeshiva Flatbush, I liked it very much, um, my kids, uh, some of my kids go there now, so they had seminar, so seminar was like a very transformative experience, did you go on a seminar? You probably, right? So it's like very transformative, and it's great, okay, and, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have transformative experiences in life, 
Um, but sometimes these transformative experiences have a very temporary effect. They don't always create a real transformation of the person, right? So, um, so okay, so, you know, uh, 10 miracles in Egypt, that's tra transformative, but, you know, after a while, and then the 50 miracles in Yamsuf also, but after a while, Yamsuf, but Har Sinai, no. Har Sinai created a true transformation of the nation of Israel. The nation that walked towards Har Sinai was not the same nation that left Har Sinai to go towards Israel. It was a different nation, and I have a lot to say about that. Okay? But just understand that concept. It was transformative, right? Right, it was like seminar. I remember people come back from seminar, that's it, like, right? But then a few weeks later, it kind of <laughs> subsided. Not, about, not to say that it wasn't a good thing, but you know. You guys will say, you know, it's not. Nice. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So, Nimseu Elu Sheshulach Lahem, Hem Haedim Alevu Atoshi Yemet. So, in a sense, it's a testimony. In a sense, the people who stood before Har Sinai, our great-great-grandparents, they gave us a testimony. We choose to accept that testimony because it makes sense, again, that unlike what you said, where maybe they're all lying. No, I don't believe that all of my parents would have lied to me. I just don't believe that. I, and then for no reason. For what, for what purpose? For what, you know, usually there's a lie. You lie for a reason, right? If I become the president, I will do X, Y, Z. Okay, he lied. Like, you know, or before the um, Israeli elections. Um, I, I, by the way, you know that I'm not, I never ever explicitly support any politician in public. Whatever my politics are, it's to me. I respect your politics, so please don't ever take anything I say about politics as to be endorsing a candidate or to be going against a candidate. I, I'm a rabbi, I like to stick as a rabbi. But before the elections, Bibi Netanyahu, brilliant leader, by the way, I can certainly say that, he's a brilliant man, but be, before, there is no way I will sit with Kachol Laban, it will never happen, before the elections, Benny Gantz said of Kachol Laban, I will never speak to Bibi, it will never happen, after the election, they're sitting down together trying to work it out, I don't know if they'll work it out or not, but the point is, oh, they lied, they don't have a choice, right, they don't have a choice, not the point, the point I'm saying is, they lied, how could they lie, and like, yeah, politicians lie all the time, because they have a reason to lie. People don't just, two million people don't get together and say, let's make up this lie, right? It just, right, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Okay. Nimse'u, so it comes out that these people were testifying. They, they said, we don't believe in Moses because of his miracles. And, and us, as the children of these people, accept their testimony. Shehem vehu it's like two, two people coming into court. Are you related? No. Father, son? No. Brother, brother? No. Okay. You're not related? Okay. What did you see? They, they, they put the other guy away. And, he, and they, they interrogate him. Bring the other guy to court. What did you see? They interrogate him. Okay, the two things align. All right. We just established a legal fact. Two witnesses establish a legal fact. And by the way, it's a great way to establish a legal fact. Also, in, I think in, in American jurisprudence, you know, you have witnesses, you interrogate the witnesses, it comes out that they're telling the truth. Okay, you establish a legal fact. That's a fact. That's how you establish it, right? So here we have a historical fact that's established by millions of people who had this experience in Harsinai. Shekol echad mehem ed lechavero shehu omer emet. Ve'en echad mehem sarich lehavir ayal chavero. Once you establish this testimony as a legal fact. You don't have to bring a video camera. You don't have to bring a tape recorder. Irrelevant, right? Video cameras, as we said in my class on Shabbat, you can doctor videos. Tape recorders, you can doctor recordings, right? You can change it. Testimony, that's the experience that a person had. And if he's an intelligent person, we accept his testimony. So also, the Jewish people are the witnesses of Moses being a prophet. And therefore, they no longer needed to see miracles for Moses. And now, to the point. But Korach didn't get that memo. Korach didn't get the memo. <laughs> 
是还按照按老师为主过去。Korach didn't get the memo. Okay, let's distinguish one thing. Korach knew that Moses was a prophet. What Korach was saying, he wasn't saying that Moses isn't a prophet, and he wasn't even saying that Moses didn't receive the Torah. And he didn't even say that the Torah that Moses presented to us is not the real Torah that Moses got in Sinai. He didn't say any of those things. Meaning, with everything that we just read, Korach would agree 100%. What did Korach say? Korach was uh, accusing Moses of nepotism. Oh, you have your brother, you put him as a Kohen Gadol, how nice and how convenient, and you have yourself, and you're the king, and you know me, I'm your uh, cousin, and, and I get nothing. I get nothing. Why is that? So he was accusing Moses of nepotism. He wasn't accusing Moses of being a fraud. There's a very big difference between those two things, right? So, and, and Hashem said, well, you were wrong about that, Korach. I mean, he, and he really was wrong because Moses was, was a very humble person and he wasn't interested in being the leader at all. So, so that was, so, Moses, so, so to answer your question, Korach got the memo about Mount Sinai, got the memo about the Torah, but he made a mistake about Moshe Rabbeinu's personality. He thought that Moses was going to try to abuse his power, when indeed he wasn't trying to abuse his power. And by the way, the Leviim, incidentally the Levites, Moses was a Levite, as it turned out, and this is in Perashat Korach, the Leviim don't get a portion of the land of Israel. Everybody gets a portion of the land of Israel, right? The Leviim don't get a portion of the land of Israel. To demonstrate the fact that our Torah leaders our spiritual leaders, the Levim are the ones who teach Torah to Am Yisrael, not only can they not use the Torah to like, you know, build up a mass fortunes for themselves, a mass real estate, it's the exact opposite. The Levim are actually denied the rights that everybody else has. So like if you look at the Christian church in medieval uh, Europe, especially before the French Revolution, I mean extending to the French Revolution, one of the reasons for the French Revolution is because there were such crazy amounts of wealth in the church. Right, the, the religious leaders, they just, they were like literally, you know, crazy amounts of money and the people were all starving to death. In Judaism, it's the exact opposite. We say, no, 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 excuse me. You're a Levi, sorry. You're supposed to teach Torah. You don't, get, you don't get what everybody else gets in the land of Israel. So like, you see how we do that? That's why we did it. So we'll never have a situation where we'll say, oh, Moses, nepotism. No, well, Moses is not getting a piece of land in Israel. Okay, you get it? So like you can't, you can't play that game. Okay. I think, by the way, and just one last thing. I think till very recent, I think, um, I know that in Jerusalem, the Christian church is one of the big real estate holders. I think also in New York, one of the biggest real estate holders, if I'm not mistaken, Archdiocese. is the Christian church, right? Archdiocese, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, um, right. So, so by us, it's not like that, it, it, right? It's just not the way Judaism allows itself to be. Yes, please. In Judea, Spanish, and this I never saw it written in any place. And you should learn about it. We say we have an expression is pecado de padre. Pecado de padre. A sin that the, the, the father, I mean, the, the church man makes. Means they always preach to others what they don't fulfill themselves. Pecado de padre. Yes? Mm-hmm. And to, to, to point out that somebody is a hypocrite. You say in Judeo Spanish, the color of the Fantastic, no? And I, you know, I look into the old things. I never saw uh, this written any place. Like when they come to the, the, anyhow. Because I was brought up in a Roman Catholic uh, uh, environment, we have all kinds of stories. <laughs> Good stories, also. Good stories. Mm-hmm. I grew up with that, so, yeah. So, uh, right. so now the point is, and this is so important. So if somebody, uh, so we, we believe that Moses had that experience. So now somebody comes, let me go back to the beginning of the class. Somebody says, I saw, you know, uh, Burak, Burak, uh, the, 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 yeah. you know, the donkey taking up uh, Muhammad. Yeah. I mean, you know, okay, I don't know. I don't know what you saw and I don't know what you drink and I don't know what you were smoking and it's all good and God bless you. You know, go with it. You know, you saw it, just go with it. Like, take it and, and go all the way, you know, and join Burak and Muhammad, and that's all good. And I respect that. And we don't, we don't, um, there's a pasuk, it says, Elohim no tekaler. So one perush of the pasuk is you're not supposed to curse 
right? Um, uh, the creator, of course. But another explanation is you're not even supposed to curse the god of another religion. Okay, okay. so we, we respect all religions. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to be mocking or this. I don't believe that's not what I do. But so, but at the same time, we also have to rela- realize the difference. So if somebody comes to me, I saw, I saw him flying off the cross, or, or Mary Magdalene, I saw him flying off the cross. I mean, with all due respect, you know, really, with all due respect, we experienced Moshe Rabbeinu. You see him flying off the cross in no way it, it, it impinges upon or affects what we experience in Sinai. It's, com- it's a complete irrelevancy, right? It's a complete, it can only affect somebody who's an idolater and he believes in goblins and ghosts and Halloween and, you know, whatever. Then maybe something like, I saw him flying off the cross, maybe affects you. But for a Jew who stood in Har Sinai, whose parents stood in Har Sinai, we are a member of this nation. We're not impressed by that. It's like, you know, you're a member of the American nation. You know, you were raised in America, the wealthiest country in the world, the freest country in the world, the most beautiful country in the world. And somebody comes from Cuba and he's trying to impress you about some, you know, little Cuban shanty. And, I'm, you know, I'm raised in America. I mean, God bless you. I'm happy that you like Cuba. And if you like it, stay there. And if you don't, you're welcome to join me in America. Right? So you get the difference. So we're, we're, we're Jews. We're Am Yisrael. We have this historical thing. Nobody else had that, by the way. Nobody else even claims to have had that. There's no claim to that. Nobody ever claims to say our entire nation experienced Hashem. So they have the Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon on the Mount is a sermon that the people heard a person giving a sermon. Wonderful. And they're wonderful words and great messages. No problem. And Muhammad has the Quran, and, and the Quran has the story of uh, Yusuf and, uh, um, and stuff like Surat al Yusuf. And, and my son likes arguing with the Qadis whenever he goes to the Palestinian territories. He's uh, been in Jenin recently. And he started to argue. Right. So he always like arguing with the Qadis about the Quran and what the Quran says about you know this and he says no the Humash says this. Okay, I have that argument. And, and, it's, and, and it's fine. We respect all religions. But ultimately, Nothing even comes close to what we experience at Har Sinai. There's nothing even that comes close to that. Nobody makes that. Nobody even dares to claim that Hashem spoke to the entire nation. It's always Hashem speaking to a person, supposedly. By the way, in the case of the Quran, I just want to be clear. Hashem never spoke to Muhammad. It's Jibreel who spoke to Muhammad. It's Gabriel, right? Just, just, just be clear. I mean, I'm saying about... I'm, I'm describing their description. I'm not making, I'm saying, as if you look at the Quran, it's Jibreel speaks to Muhammad and Muhammad speaks to the people. That's the, uh, that's the way it works. Nobody claims that Hashem spoke to them and gave them the law. It doesn't exist anywhere in humanity. It's such a bizarre, incredible, enlightening experience that it just wasn't, nobody even suggested that, that happened to them. You get it? So Moses was the greatest prophet. He was the only one this ever happened to. No prophet was at the level of Moses that Hashem spoke to him directly. No prophet will ever be at the level of Moses going forward into history. Even the Mashiach will not reach the Madriga Moshe Rabbeinu. So what Moses gave us, what did he give us? The Torah? It's as eternal as his um, unique stature in history. It's as eternal as that. Mm-hmm. Moses is at the top. The Torah is at the top. It will always be at the top. You understand the point? And that's this lesson. That's, this is the sevental point of Judaism. And think about it and understand the difference between Amisel and the rest of the nation. We have another minute. If you want to say something, yeah. and, and we'll finish with that. According to the Christian position, see, I, I was brought up in a Christian environment. I was in Spain. I got out of the in Spain. So, yeah. Anyhow, the mother of Jesus called Mary you remember the last second name? Mm-hmm. Magdalena. Mary yeah. Ma- Magdalena. It's a beautiful name. Yes. But Magdalena means from the Miktar. Mary, who is known Magdalena, from, from the Miktar. What does the word Migdal mean in Hebrew? Migdal is like a tower where the army stays. Yes? And nothing wrong with that. And that army was in Roman times. So the Roman army was in the Migdal. And she was the lady known as Mary, the one who goes to the Migdal. So what could she be doing? Yeah. <laughs>
feeding wife. Why was she called Mary the McDonald's girl? Think about it. Yeah, they believe that. That's not disputed. Yeah. yeah, that's their belief. That's their belief. That's exactly but the way. But she was a virgin. That's the Right, no, no, right. But that, that's See, a, I was born in South America, so I could show all, all kind of horrible uh, jokes that you would expel me from the synagogue. From a, she was married.